prominent federal court of appeals judge has just written a scathing dissenting opinion saying that the New York Times and many other media have become house organs for the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, that you cannot trust much of the media to give you objective news, and he would change the First Amendment rules under New York Times versus Sullivan to take this change into account. We'll talk about that on The Der Show, and we'll ask what do you think? Should the First Amendment be changed? Should New York Times versus Sullivan be overruled? because of the sins and lack of objectivity of the New York Times and other media. In the 1963, 1964 Supreme Court term, um, I was privileged to be a law clerk. I was a law clerk to Justice Arthur Goldberg, who had been the uh, Secretary of Labor and a very distinguished labor lawyer. It was a great experience to be a law clerk on the Supreme Court during the height of the civil rights movement. Uh, and our chambers, Justice Goldberg's chambers, wrote a lot of the most important civil rights cases and civil liberties cases, including several important First Amendment uh, cases, and I helped to draft um, uh, some of them. One of the most important cases we had that term is now very famous. It's called New York Times versus Sullivan. It involved an ad uh, in the New York Times uh, condemning sheriffs uh, from a southern area for abuse, and it contained lots of mistakes. Uh, the Times admitted that it contained mistakes and, and issued a retraction, admitting their errors. But one of the sheriffs sued, and the case came to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling saying when a public figure is defamed, and the sheriff was a public figure, that in order for him to win against the New York Times or any media, he has to show that the New York Times engaged in constitutional malice, actual malice. Malice under the Constitution doesn't mean kind of nastiness, you don't like somebody. It means a reckless disregard for the truth or knowingly publishing something that you know is is false. And um, so that became the governing standard. Justice Goldberg wrote a concurring opinion, which I played a small part in drafting and reviewing, in which he made a distinction that the courts have not accepted, but that's a very useful distinction. He said, yeah, yeah, public figures, if you attack a public figure, then you should have to show malice. But he said, only if you attack that public figures, public actions, then you have to show malice. But if you say that that public figure committed adultery or that public figure uh, did something in his private life that was wrong, you don't get any exception because the public interest in disclosure of a public figure's private life is not as compelling as the public interest in disclosing the public actions. I mean, the Alexander Hamilton case comes to uh, mind. Alexander Hamilton uh, committed adultery uh, and paid extortion to cover up his adultery. And then he was accused of paying the extortion from public funds, from treasury funds. So if anybody accused him of paying the money from treasury funds, that would be accusing him of doing something in his public function. But if they just accused him of adultery, uh, that would be in his private life. And Justice Goldberg made that distinction, but the court didn't buy it. The court said a public figure is a public figure, and you can defame him with impunity uh, in his private life, public life, as long as you don't do it with malice. Well, this past week, one of the great uh, judges in America, a man named Lawrence Silberman, used to be, I think, Deputy Attorney General of the United States, a very distinguished, conservative, Reagan-appointed a judge who's now a senior judge, he's my age or maybe older, uh, wrote a very striking uh, dissenting opinion in another defamation case. The defamation case itself involved an organization called Global Witness, um, which claimed that uh, certain officials bribed certain other officials, and turns out that they may have been wrong about it. And the majority opinion said, yeah, but you didn't really allege malice in the constitutional sense of so case dismissed. Silverman says, no, 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 wait a minute. You know, things have changed uh, in the last uh, 50 years since New York Times versus Sullivan. 
And he went into a very detailed discussion of what's happened to the media, that the New York Times is no longer the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times used to be an objective, uh, the newspaper of record, the gray old lady. Today, Silberman says it's the party organ of the Democratic Party, indeed of the left wing of the Democratic uh, Party. Uh, it has become a predictable newspaper, not only on its editorial pages, it has the right to do that, but in its news pages. He's 100 percent right. You cannot trust the news today in The New York Times to give you an unbiased assessment. He says the same thing about The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, The Los Angeles Times um, and uh, the um, news part of The Wall Street Journal. I'm not sure he's right about The Wall Street Journal. But he surely is right about at least the New York Times. I'm not sure he's right about the Globe either, but New York Times he's right about. And then he says, of course, on the other side, you have news organizations that are party organs of the right wing of the Republican Party. He focuses on Fox and Fox News and the New York Post. And he says it's an even greater danger because the conservative, major conservative organs are all controlled by the same person uh, and his son. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, what we're seeing is really an end to objective news reporting. And what we're seeing is the development, and he says, really, it's over the past several years, of party newspapers, of just newspapers that represent their political party, much the way Pravda represented the Communist Party, and early Israeli newspapers were party newspapers. There was a party, a, a newspaper that was controlled by political parties. That's no longer the case. Um, it's still the case in some European uh, countries, but uh, it was never supposed to be the case in the United States. And so Judge Silberman suggested that the New York Times versus Sullivan be overruled. He said, after all, it wasn't really a constitutional doctrine. It was a policy decision. There's nothing in the Constitution that distinguishes between uh, malicious defamation and unintended uh, defamation. Um, I think he's wrong about that. I think implicit in the Constitution is the right to be wrong. It wasn't true of the common law at the time the Constitution was enacted. The, the courts did distinguish between truth and, 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 and falsity. If you made a false statement, uh, you could be held liable even if you made it against a, a public figure. But when you have a Supreme Court decision that's uh, that influential and that uh, uh, has a long history, it's very hard to get it overruled. And as he points out, Silberman points out in his decision, courts are going to be very reluctant to overrule New York Times versus Sullivan because the one thing they can be assured of is that the New York Times will attack them, as will all the other newspapers. So they would get a lot of media uh, criticism if they overruled New York Times uh, versus Sullivan. It's an interesting issue, and I'd be interested in your views, whether you think that newspapers should have a license to lie. That's what New York Times versus Sullivan gives them, a license to lie and distort, as long as they can plausibly claim they did it without malice. Obviously, I have an interest in this because I have a case where I'm arguing that uh, CNN deliberately, maliciously lied, doctored a tape in which I said that a president could be impeached if he did anything unlawful or illegal. And they took out the words unlawful and illegal, CNN did, and had commentators then say Dershowitz says a president can't be impeached even if he does something unlawful and illegal. Exactly the opposite of what I said. So they just took out the crucial words, edited it, and their claim is no, they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. They just edited. That's what they do. Uh, media edits. They don't have enough time to put everything out. Yeah. You don't edit the words unlawful and illegal and then have your commentators get on television and say, Dershowitz says it doesn't matter if it's unlawful or illegal. He can still not be impeached. A president can do anything. He can shoot somebody. He can kill somebody. He can tamper with the, uh, with the elections. He can do whatever he wants. No, no, that's not what I said. It's the opposite of what I said. So I have a stake in this. But I'm not sure I want to see New York Times versus Sullivan overruled. Uh, I might be in favor of seeing it limited in some way and um, narrowing some of the definitions of what uh, uh, constitutes exculpatory conduct for newspapers. I really do think that a reckless disregard for the truth uh, should include 
kind of a willingness to try to change the thrust of what people have said. I'll give you an example of, of a case that that might come within uh, a, a, a changed definition of malice. So yesterday's New York Times had a front page story, the major story right in the center of the front page, saying that Donald Trump had given a lot of commutations and pardons, executive clemency, on behalf of Orthodox Jewish organizations and at the behest of his allies like Alan Dershowitz, me. I'm featured in the story as somebody who helped a dozen or so people get commutations, some pardons uh, and uh, some commutations. Hey, I'm very proud of the role I played. Uh, I helped uh, people be reunited with their families after they suffered from extraordinarily uh, long sentences. Let me just give you a couple of examples to put it in context. Um, well before I became a lawyer um, defending uh, against impeachment in the Senate at a time when I hardly knew um, President Trump, I helped get a commutation for a Jewish man, Orthodox Jewish na man named Shalom Raboshkin, who had been sentenced to an extraordinarily excessive sentence of more than 20 years for something that people normally get two or three years for. He was accused of overstating his accounts receivable to a bank in an effort to obtain a loan. And he got a sentence which many thought were a function of anti-Semitism by a judge in the in the Middle West, in an area uh, of Iowa where um, uh, uh, there was a history of, of Jew hatred, um, and um, I helped persuade the president that this was an excessive sentence, and he commuted the sentence, and uh, he was allowed out of prison after serving many many years, served a long long prison term, but he was had his sentence shortened to what he would have gotten had he been tried in another part of the country. Very proud of that. Uh, shortly thereafter, I helped with others, including a Jewish organization named Aleph, to get a commutation for a man named uh, Nachmani, whose wife was dying of, of cancer, and there were a bunch of children at home that wouldn't have a, a parent. And he was sentenced to excess of 20 years for selling a, a marijuana derivative, something that used to be legal and then became legal again, but was illegal during a relatively short period of time when he was convicted. 20-something years for openly selling this marijuana derivative, having a wife who was going to die of cancer with children at home with nobody to take care of them. Yeah, so I helped get his sentence commuted. And just last week, the wife died, tragically. And fortunately, they have a father now to take care of them. Who wouldn't be proud? of helping to bring those about both both pro bono cases. I didn't make any money on, on those cases. And then um, late last year, the president called me and asked me, what did I think of a commutation for two people, uh, both of whom uh, were offered sentences of between seven and 10 years. In other words, single digit sentences if they pleaded guilty, but they didn't think they were guilty. It was a close case. It was a gray area fraud case. And so they went to trial and they were both convicted and they got 75 and 85 year sentences, 10 times the amount they would have gotten had they pleaded. The government, in other words, said, we think this crime deserves seven years. That's what the crime deserves. The additional 70 years was for the, quote, crime of exercising their First Amendment right to go to trial. And so I gave the president a little bit of a seminar on what we call the trial penalty. Since 1964, I've been railing against the trial penalty, penalizing people for exercising their constitutional right to go to trial. And again, it was a pro bono case, and the president granted those two commutations, and both of these men came home, and I said to them, I gave them a lecture, as I give to all the people who I helped get out of prison. I said, you have to do several things. One, you have to make us proud that you got this commutation. You have to live a good life, a peaceful life, a lawful life. Second, you have to give back to the community. You have to, you got free. You have to help other people in your situation um, uh, get, get, get free. And, and third, you just have to be a good, 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 good person. And if you ever get in trouble again, don't call me. And none of the people that I've helped get commutations or pardons for have ever gotten in trouble again. Uh, I've stayed in touch with them. Uh, I call them. They call me. 
I'm very proud of the role I played, and I'm very proud of the fact that I worked together with an organization called Aleph, which has helped many, many people, prisoners, others. They help Jews and non-Jews alike. And I failed to get commutations for several people that I really wanted to get them for. One, an 80-year-old man who was going to die in prison for something that probably wasn't a crime. And I failed. I couldn't get. I tried to get two people taken off death row at the last minute. Um, I spoke to the president personally about one of those cases, and he, he wouldn't do it. So. I wasn't a magic doer. I wasn't a fixer. I was someone who President Trump respected. He respected my legal views. That's why he asked me to make the case against impeachment in the Senate. And he respected my views on commutation. I only recommended commutations in cases where <clears throat> I thought they were deserved. But the Times has a front page story blaming me, blaming Olive, the Jewish organization, blaming uh, President Trump without really going into comparisons. President Trump gave a total of 238 clemencies, some pardons, some commutations, 238. Compare that to President Obama, 1,700. And the number of Orthodox Jews among the 238, the number of people who were helped either by me, I, I advocated for Jews and non-Jews alike. I make no such distinction in my advocacy. And, and by the way, uh, Olaf uh, advocates for Jews and non-Jews alike and has helped me in cases where I've represented non-Jews. So uh, 238, probably 25 of them, uh, maybe one-tenth, involved uh, people of the Jewish faith and um, uh, mostly nonviolent uh, crimes, crimes uh, involving white collar. Uh, issues where the disparities in sentencing are enormously high. And, and so why the focus on Trump? Why not the focus on Obama? 1,700 of them. Many of them, many of them, people of his uh, ethnic background, I'm not criticizing him for that. There are a lot of black people in prison today unjustly. And God bless him for giving commutations and pardons to people of every race and background, but especially to African-Americans who were serving long sentences for drug-related offenses. It's only natural that a president will look perhaps more sympathetically at cases that are closer to his own experience. And uh, obviously Trump has more experience in dealing with people from the New York uh, metropolitan area who may be involved in some kind of white collar uh, crime. Uh, and, and Barack Obama, with uh, his attorney general, perhaps were more sympathetic to other kinds of cases. Now, the other argument that was made is that President Trump and the White House <clears throat> made most of the decisions about commutations rather than going through the Justice Department's Pardon Bureau. Well, much the same was true of the Obama administration. They technically went through the pardon and parole pardon process of the Justice Department. But remember, the Justice Department was totally controlled by Obama. He had his buddy in there, his attorney general, Eric Holder, who did his bidding. Uh, I don't know of any situation where there was any conflict or any uh, disagreement between Obama and, and Eric Holder. And uh, also, Obama appointed people uh, in the White House, in the White House, special people, to go through the applications. And I'm sure that Obama's friends, and I'm sure lawyers who he had uh, uh, respect for, called directly the White House and did exactly what happened um, with the, the Trump ad administration. That's the way the pardon process works. The president has sole authority to pardon and commute any person who's been convicted of any federal crime for any reason. Um, and sure, uh, the New York Times has a right to criticize how any president exercises that clemency power. But to focus, I think they've now had three articles uh, focusing on Trump's clemency process. And um, certainly nothing like that uh, came out of the Obama administration. So, yes, the New York Times has become the party organ of the Democratic Party and of the left wing of the Democratic Party. Now, should that change New York Times versus Sullivan? Well, 
it shouldn't abolish it. I'm not in favor of overruling New York Times versus Sullivan. Maybe I have a nostalgic feeling because I was part of the process that produced that decision, but I'm perfectly happy to be open-minded about it. And I do think that some changes are in order. You know, we live in the age of social media and the internet. And, and Silberman, Judge Silberman makes a good point. He says that uh, the media today have an enormous influence on elections, um, uh, an enormous influence on public perception. Uh, not only newspapers like The Times, but CNN and social media. And if they all incline in one way and fail to report uh, items that are critical of the Democratic Party or negative to the Democratic Party and only report items that are negative to uh, the Republican Party, we're going to see a skewed political process. It reminds me of Thomas Jefferson. Before he became president, uh, he had said, given a choice between a government without newspapers or a newspaper, newspapers without a government, he would have no hesitation to select newspapers without a government. Then he became president. And he was viciously attacked, viciously attacked for the, for the uh, Louisiana Purchase, uh, for you name it. He was attacked, and he wrote to a friend after he was president, that people who don't read any newspapers are better informed often than people who read newspapers. So his approach to the media differed considerably after he was president than before he was president. He was still a big supporter, obviously, of freedom of speech, as am I, but one can be a big supporter of freedom of speech and a, a critic, a major critic of the, of the press. Um, a newspaper the other day ran a headline saying, why do we need Der Sturmo or the Daily Storm if we have the New York Times? The New York Times has gone so far out of its way to uh, criticize Orthodox Jews, to criticize Jews, to criticize Israel, to criticize Democrats, to criticize, I'm sorry, to criticize uh, Republicans, to criticize conservatives, to laud Democrats, to praise uh, selectively people who they agree with and condemn people who they disagree with. They really have become the party organ of the Democratic Party. And how should the First Amendment deal with that? So I'm going to leave that to you. This is a law school seminar, and now it's, it's your turn. You've heard my uh, point of view on this. I think New York Times versus Sullivan is important. I think that malice is defined uh, a little bit too narrowly and should be broadened, and I don't think newspapers should have a license to lie. The media should have some degree of accountability to the law of defamation. We've already talked about Section 230. They should have some accountability if they are newspapers and publishers rather than platforms. A lot of stuff to talk about. And so I'd love to hear your views on the First Amendment, on what's happening to the media. Do you agree that the media has slanted left? In a little footnote, Judge Silberman, in his opinion, says, among the reasons why the media has slanted left is that academia has pushed hard left and people go through academia and then become the editors and the staffers of the media so don't be surprised if academia the left tilt more than a tilt the left shove of academia uh, away uh, from neutrality will and has resulted in a major tilt and a major shift of the media uh, remember when I was growing up and before that, in the early 20th century, the media generally were right wing. Uh, the media were generally very conservative. New York Times was quite conservative. Wall Street Journal was very conservative. Many of the newspapers uh, were very conservative. Um, um, and uh, many of us complained about that. And today we see a shift and we should complain about that as well. Oh, for the days of Walter Cronkite, when you could really trust what a giant of the media had to say. But today, people get fired from the New York Times if they express views different from the New York Times, or they're pressured into retiring and resigning from the New York Times. We've seen that happen, and it's a scandal. The New York Times should be much more responsible, much more neutral, much more objective. But I'm not sure I want to see the law change and the First Amendment limited because of the sins of the current media.
So let's hear what your views are on this complicated, difficult issue under the First Amendment. Please call in and give me your views. You don't have to ask questions. You can just state your views in less than a minute on The Dirt Show. Okay, let's turn to our first caller of the day. Good evening, Your Excellency, Professor Dershowitz. I have a First Amendment question for you. Suppose that the federal government found out that one of its employees has been regularly writing uh, racist comments on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Can they fire him immediately for that? Or suppose they decide to give him another chance. Can they say to him, that if you ever write face, uh, 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 racist comments on Twitter and Facebook again, you will be fired immediately? I look forward to your answer, Professor Dershowitz. Uh, what a great question and a difficult one. Under the law today, probably the person uh, could be fired, depending on his job, depending on whether he was a civil servant, depending on whether he had some kind of tenure, depending on whether he was a political appointee. But in general, you can fire people for expressing racist views or views that are inconsistent with their job description. Uh, I don't know if the person was a manual laborer and had his views had nothing to do with uh, his uh, job, uh, whether you could fire him for that. But but that can be done. That doesn't mean you can impeach a president for that because a president can't be fired. He's not like anybody else. He can only be impeached for treason, bribery, other high crimes and misdemeanors. The Democrats made the serious mistake during the second impeachment of saying it's analogous to the government firing somebody for making racist comments. No, that's a false analogy. But your question is a very, very, very difficult one. And, you know, one might argue that uh, a government official has the right privately to express whatever views he wants on Facebook uh, without it endangering his job, because the First Amendment, after all, does apply to the federal government. And the federal government would be engaging in censorship if it did that. So it's a very good question, very hard question, one with no definitive answer. Professor Dershowitz, this is Tom calling from California. The, the judge will not move the Minneapolis trial of a police officer. This seems patently unfair. It's the only remedy that the defendant police officer has to spend a fortune to take this on appeal. And what does this tell us about other people in similar situations who cannot afford to take an appeal? Uh, why is it so difficult to straighten out one justice's, one judge's decision? Thank you. Well, judges have a lot of discretion as to whether or not to move a trial, but that discretion is bounded by the Constitution. I believe it was a fundamental error for the judge not to move it. By the way, he shouldn't have only moved the location of the trial, the courthouse, to a rural area. He should have selected a rural jury, not a jury from Minneapolis. He should have selected a jury and a location in which none of the jurors had to fear personal retaliation, attacks on their business, attacks on their schools, attacks on their children, attacks on themselves, if they rendered a verdict of acquittal or refused to convict for the murder charges. To me, that's the biggest issue, that jurors will be frightened and will put their own uh, thumb of their own safety on the scale of justice. So I think it was a terrible mistake. You're right. The only remedy is to appeal after conviction. There's a very limited area of what's called writs of mandamus where you can actually challenge a judge's ruling while the case is ongoing. I'm not sure it would operate in, in this case. And so uh, appeal is the only remedy and uh, appellate courts are going to be reluctant to reverse a conviction that is going to be quite popular with the general public, particularly in, in large cities. Lenore from Texas, comment about the University of Vermont and the professor you interviewed. Alan, I hope that you will stay abreast with this professor and let us know 
how he's doing because it sounds like they're going to fire him. Never in our lifetime did these prof- university professors need help from great lawyers like you, and I hope you can help them. I mean, I know you work some pro bono, but I think we need a GoFund page, GoFundMe page for university professors that are getting booted out of their jobs for no reason at all. Let us know how this professor fares. Thank you. I will. I'll keep in, in touch with him and find out. I just want to disagree with one point. You may be right. Never in your lifetime has this happened. But in my lifetime, it did happen. I'm older than you, I'm sure. And so during McCarthyism, professors were booted. Elementary school teachers, the best math teacher I had in all of high school was a guy who was booted from the public schools because of some allegation that in the 1930s he may have gone to a meeting of the Communist Party. And he was a phenomenal math teacher, and we benefited from him because my little yeshiva, I went to a Jewish parochial school, my little yeshiva was willing to hire somebody who was fired by the public schools, but people were being fired willy-nilly from elementary schools, high schools, colleges, law schools, um, medical schools, you name it. Um, One of the great doctors that um, I know and just died recently, Uh, had trouble getting internships and residencies because of his uh, affiliation with people on the left. So we've had it in the past, but we haven't had it for many, many years, and we're seeing it now. It was wrong then, and it's wrong now. I fought it then. I'm going to fight it now. Professor Dershowitz, this is Ron from Pennsylvania. I enjoy your shows very much. They're a much-needed break from life through the looking glass as we now live. (laughs) I'm calling to ask if you would explain what a hate crime is and how hate crime legislation came to be. More importantly, perhaps, can you explain what the objective criteria are for a hate crime? This seems like a very subjective and potentially dangerous label to me. The Atlanta mass murder this week brought media headlines claiming a hate crime, though when one drills down on the facts, they don't seem to really fit that narrative. I'm struggling to understand how a murder, for example, is made any worse or better by being labeled a hate crime. Someone's dead after all. Aside from proving the perpetrator had motive, means, and opportunity to commit the murder, what purpose does it serve to attempt to attribute some or all of the motive to the murderer's biases? Thank you. It's a great question, and I tend to agree with you. I'm not in favor of categorizing crimes by the subjective, hateful motives of uh, people. If you kill somebody because you hate them or if you kill somebody because you love them, as you say, the same uh, result. Um, The Supreme Court has permitted uh, the concept of hate crimes in limited, narrow circumstances. It can be taken into account in sentencing. Um, I I don't think that we really benefit much by distinguishing between somebody who shoots into a car because he's just a terrible person and he wants to get revenge on society and a person who shoots into a car because he sees it has people of a certain race or background. Emotionally, it it does make a difference. Um, If somebody attacks you because you're black or because you're Asian or because you're Jewish or because you're Catholic uh, or because you're Latino, uh, it it may sting more. Maybe it stings less because it's less personal. Who knows? But I think that uh, law enforcement should be based on more objective uh, criteria than subjective criteria and also how how to distinguish. Um, In this case in Atlanta, it's going to be impossible. The guy had uh, sexual motives, maybe religious motives, maybe a third or fourth motive in the back of his mind was if these were um, uh, Caucasian people, maybe he wouldn't have shot them. Who knows? Maybe he would have. Um, not all of the people were, were Asian. But, uh, you know, when you think about that case in the context of what clearly are hate crimes that are being directed against Asian Americans all over the country, obviously it creates a worrisome, a worrisome phenomenon. I am not against uh, prosecutors and police having special hate crime units because those help in investigation and those help in prevention. The question is, once the person is caught, if it's the right person, should the hatred become an additional element of the crime, which adds perhaps additional years to the sentence? That's a debatable proposition. I'd be interested in hearing what other people have to say on that. Let's turn now to our last call for the day. Hello, this is Wes in Texas. 
Dear Mr. Dershowitz, please explain which rule or rules of the English language you are applying to the Second Amendment to conclude that the modifier, well regulated, applies to arms. The modifier plainly applies to militia, not to arms. Note the placement of the comma also. Please correct your misinterpretation. Thank you. I appreciate your call, but it's not a misinterpretation. It's a policy decision. I think that one can make a strong argument that the Second Amendment was not intended to give anybody a personal right to carry a gun, that it was only designed to allow states to have state militias. Uh, you can read the Second Amendment that way, and it was read that way for 200 years. Only until the last 20 years did any uh, justices read the Second Amendment as saying there's a personal right to own guns. Uh, you know, the, the, the well-regulated militia part is the modifier for the entire Second Amendment. So what I'm saying is that the reason the framers allowed guns was because they knew that they would be part of a militia and militias have to be well-regulated. A fortiori, it follows logically that if there is an individual right to own guns, controversial, disputed, uh, five to four decision, um, many scholars, many historians don't believe that's a correct interpretation of the Second Amendment. But if it is, at the very least, the guns, like the militia, have to be well regulated. So I don't think it's a question of grammar or commas. I think it's a question of how you read the entire Second Amendment. And it, there's a plausible reading of the Second Amendment that denies you the right to own a gun unless you're in a militia that's well regulated. The courts ruled against that. That doesn't mean that well regulated shouldn't modify the entire Second Amendment. I think it should. Well, great calls, great seminar, ranging from the Second Amendment to the First Amendment to, you know, everything we discuss in law schools. I'm looking forward to more of your calls. Please tell your friends to subscribe. Uh, through Rumble, YouTube, Spotify, any of the platforms. Uh, nothing will be censored on this show. Your calls will be responded to. So please, more of your calls, more of your comments on The Dirt Show. An important part of The Dirt Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show.